Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar on Build Your Customer Graph, a complete view of the connected customer experience. Uh, I'm Stuart File, Custom Publishing Director of Ad Week, and I will be the host for today's webinar, which is being brought to you uh, in partnership with Newstar. Uh, before we begin, I just want to go over a few things related to the platform and the timing of the event. Uh, the, web and the formal presentation will go for about 35 to 40 minutes. Afterwards, we will have time for about 10 to 15 minutes of audience Q&A. So if you have a question for today's speakers, just simply use the Q&A widget on 24 on the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can during that time. If we don't get to your question, we always make sure that they get forwarded over to the speakers so they will have a chance to respond to you offline. Um, we are supporting social sharing on today's webinar. Uh, and you'll see down there on the bottom right the hashtag we're using, hashtag customer graph. Uh, so if you're out there on Twitter, uh, give us a quick shout. Uh, let us know you're here as part of the audience and participate in the social conversation on Twitter. Uh, there's also a Twitter widget in On24 where you can see things, uh, anything that comes in with the uh, customer graph hashtag. Uh, it's not too late to invite a colleague to today's webinar. Uh, another widget on the bottom uh, right-hand side of your screen looks like a paper airplane. That will open up a pre-populated email. It has a link over to the registration page for today's webinar. So go ahead and invite your colleagues. If they can't make it live, today's webinar is being recorded, and they will have a chance to catch the on-demand version. Well, excuse me there. That was uh, one of our speakers has their phone on. Uh, we'll, we'll get that one fixed up. So again, uh, invite your colleagues. They can catch the, uh, the on-demand version. Uh, also want to point out the resource list. That's the green button in there. You'll find uh, some useful links as well as a link over to a PDF of today's slide deck. Um, Finally, uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar, you know, feel free to catch any of the other ones, uh, Adweek webinars we have coming up. Uh, you can check our webinar calendar, adweek.com slash webinars. Follow us on Twitter, at AWWebinars. We'll keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Uh, I am very pleased today to uh, have two very accomplished speakers uh, joining us. Uh, we're, we're proud to have Stephen Wolf Pereira who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Newstar, where he oversees really all of Newstar's brand advertising, communications, corporate marketing, and product marketing. And uh, he has made his rounds uh, at marketing, media, and technology companies prior to Newstar. Uh, and of course, he also has a very special guest today, uh, Joshua Lowcock, who is the Head of Digital uh, US for UM. Uh, and I will pass this over to Stephen uh, so he can certainly uh, pick up from there and give us a, a great intro. Well, great. Thank you so much, Stuart, and the team at Adweek. You've been great. And uh, really excited to discuss building your customer graph with Joshua Lowcock. Um, you know, for me, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have someone that isn't just a great marketer who doesn't only understand the media side of it and the digital side of it, but also Joshua is technical. And so, you know, he has a great background. And so if we, if we go to, you know, a little bit of a bio, um, you know, having seen Joshua kind of come out of EY, uh, Ernst & Young, really getting a lot of great network and, and technical expertise working at nine networks, which is in Australia, and then joined the Starcom team, um, working a lot of out of Asia Pacific. And then he was going back into a technical role where he was at News Corp. And then she went to media at Invest, and then most recently uh, is now the chief digital officer at Universal McCann, and he's worked with some of the most uh, impressive brands in the world, uh, like Coca-Cola, Procter and Gamble, and Walmart. So thank you, Joshua, for being a part of this. No, not a problem, Stephen. And uh, you know, I just. Uh, really would love to establish what is the desired outcome of this webinar. We'd really love to talk about three kind of key areas. One is understanding what is the identity challenge today to understand what are marketers' priorities and how do they think about uh, the identity challenge with the scope of their work and how do they prioritize things. 
And then third is really understanding how to build a customer graph. That's really you know, kind of the focus here. We want to understand how to go about it and what are the building blocks so that you actually have something that you could take away and you'll find a value. Um, what we think is really important is the lens that we're looking at all this. And there's so much, I guess, noise in the marketplace. You have a lot of focus from vendors talking about, you know, shiny objects, um, but what we really want to do is look at everything today through the lens of the marketer. We really want to put the brand at the center. And if you think about it, it's really hard to do that today because there is so much noise. There is always some type of loom escape. There is always some type of um, you know, new shiny object, new technology out there. And I think it's really hard for marketers to really focus on what matters. And when you think about you know, the, the, all the noise out there, how do marketers really find signal? And I think one of the biggest, most important things that are happening today is that we're seeing this incredible shift where audiences have now been divorced from media. And so you're no longer in the realm of media planning and media buying. We now see a shift to audience planning and audience buying. And the reality is audience buying is just um, programmatic, if you think about it. It's just another way to say programmatic buying of audiences, but where a lot of the interest and action is, is around audience planning. And at the heart of understanding an audience is identity. And so I'd love to have Joshua, you know, give us a little bit of your thoughts. You recently wrote a post, um, an article for Ad Exchanger, all around identity and this whole idea around understanding audiences, and it really struck a chord in the industry. Uh, lots of folks are talking about it. Can you share a little bit about why did you write this article and what's your kind of, I guess, initial thesis around where we are with identity, what, what the identity challenge is today? Okay, so the reason why I originally wrote it is, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the industry around ad fraud and sort of the underlying thesis is it's not ad fraud that's the issue, it's the lack of industry focus on identity and understanding audiences and putting effort into actually understanding audience and identity-based data. So one of the things I talked about in the article is if you look at when people do a media buy, most people look at what sites and publishers are part of the buy, and they're not asking the questions about what audience and data is informing the buy. And I use an analogy from the big short, which is if you're looking at targeting, and in the article I talked about targeting beauty enthusiasts, and there's multiple sources of data you can use. You can use real transactional data that you might be sourcing from a retailer. You can source logged in behavior on something like Facebook or Google or you can look at behavior on a, an e-commerce website where someone might add something to a shopping cart and then drop off the site. Or you can look at contextual data and you know people looking at beauty content. And what happens is all of these things get bundled up into something that's called a, a beauty enthusiast and clients and agencies buy this data. Then what happens is you find out that the data is not actually very good because fraud actually happens because it's easy to fake traffic on beauty enthusiast websites. It's actually also easy to fake traffic on e-commerce websites and add things anonymously to a cart and then disappear so people fall into a retargeting bucket. But the real issue is what data are you building your media planning off and is it audience-based? And are you providing, putting the same level of diligence into verifying that data that you would be typing in a URL and going, hey, yep, you know, this website exists. And as an industry, we need to step up and actually focus on solving for audience and data integrity to the point where we need data and integrity and identity standards. So, you know, so speaking of identity standards, you know, this is really kind of one of the key themes, which is if you don't get identity right, everything else that you do will be wrong. And, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, that kind of concept because there's lots of first-party, second-party, third-party data, just the whole ecosystem. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how do you think about data versus identity? Yeah, so that's, that's a good ask. And, you know, on slide nine, there's sort of there's this chronic marketing dilemma, which is, you know, we're all after if you want scale, you end up going into third-party data. That's 
value, less quality, and it's probably, you know, to be very frank, it's recycled data. So everybody's hashing and matching and sharing it all around that's of diminishing quality. The thing that everyone needs to be focusing on is that green bucket, this first party data. So, you know, real CRM data, the direct mail, the e commerce, email loyalty, website data. And while it might have less scale, it intrinsically has more value because it's linked to real people and real people that you understand. And then once you've got that and you've got your first party data and later on we'll talk about, you know, the strategy for approaching that, that's then instead of, when, and again, where most people make the mis mistake and misstep is they go start looking for third party data to augment their, you know, their first party data is you need to look at second party data sources. And every client that I've had the privilege of working with has other trusted partners that they work with who should be your first stop in terms of a data coalition or your second party data partnership. So, you know, Walmart was previously a client, CVS is currently a, a client of mine. They have suppliers that bring product in. Those should be the ones that you're looking to to augment your data with. And it's only then do you go out to third party data sources. So focus in on first and then build out quality with second party data sources. And one of the things in the industry which we just don't talk enough about is quality second party data sources and is there even any value in achieving scale and is the scale actually going to drive ROI? And what I would challenge everyone to do is when you start looking at all of these things, you look at actual incremental cost of adding on these additional sources of data and then actually value out is adding on the third party data source driving incremental ROI or are you achieving scale for the benefit of getting scale with no value? And that's and, a and nice sort of that's, segue. Yeah, I was say that that's a that that's a, that's a key issue, this whole idea of scale and you know, you have um you know, kind of one of your hot buttons is you, you have all these folks out in the industry talking about billions of cookies, but yet there's only 324 million people in the U.S., for example. So somehow the math doesn't add up. And, you know, there was a very famous quote, um, you know, Julie Fleischer, when she was at Kraft, she spoke about how 90% of data is crap. So, you know, I'm curious, um, you, you know, what is your perspective on that? And how do you think about it when you're working with your brands, with your clients? How do you advise them on, you know, trying to differentiate between all this scale, but at the end of the day, it's really not coming down to true identity? I mean, so I think Julie's quote is apt, and it's a comment that I say often to clients. And what I'm all, like, the the real challenge is it's getting people to trade off like it's this real balancing act which is granularity of identity and achieving scale and not making things I always say like if you get too granular you're better off you know hiring door-to-door -door salespeople going around knocking on the door going hey have you heard of coke would you like to buy some so there is a balancing act the thing is when you start adding on the additional layer of data it's the questions you have got to ask is is it based on real people what is it sourced from and is it something I can measure the value against? So like I'm a big fa fan of retail based data because one of the things I say is until the robot uprising comes, robots aren't going to go in store and buy your products. So data that's based on retail data is intrinsically valued. Data that's based on billing based data, so carrier data, credit card data, things like that, intrinsically more valuable. And then everything else, so you've, and you've got first part of the data obviously at the start of all of that, and then everything else you've got to start going, is it valuable? And you've got to apply a scorecard risk assessment to it, which is how easy is it to fake, impersonate, those sorts of things. I used to work with a CEO years ago whose son was a, a Jaguar enthusiast. And his son always went to the Jaguar website and was configuring his ideal fantasy car. And, the kid was 16 years old, and that's there's so many instances of that kind of behaviour, which is the tyre kickers, the people that waste time. You go, 
is that sort of behavior something that you're relying on as a data source? Because if you are, you're like, that's interesting. It's a nice attribute. But if they're not logged into the site or I'm not verifying them with a Facebook login and they're just configuring a car anonymously, I categorically should not be relying on it with the same level of veracity of anything else. So, 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 how do you think about you know some of the challenges that you know are really plaguing a lot of marketers today? You know, some things to consider is the idea of overlapping data sets, right? Like, you know, one vendor is talking about this audience. You know, I, I think an example that Jewel used to talk about when she was at Craft is you know grillers, and so you know maybe someone has a griller audience, but once you start unpacking that, what does that really mean? So maybe a griller means that it's someone that went to a cooking website. And maybe another audience is someone that actually was browsing grills on an e-commerce site. And maybe another one is someone that really loves outdoors. Um, so it's really hard to understand the overlapping data sets. And then ultimately, you can't really trust the impressions that you see. Um, so, you know, this whole idea of you could see lots of, you know, impressions, you could have lots of audiences, but what do you really trust? And then that gets complicated or it's, it's further um, exacerbated with the challenges of things like programmatic where, you know, you have all these issues that we're seeing is something real, the viewability challenges, the cross device. Um, do you want to, you know, kind of give your, your point of view on the challenges of programmatic? Yeah, I mean, one of the, like, if you think about that impressions comment, and it's really easy to buy media impressions, and I always say to clients, like, if you want me to buy media impressions, that's easy. There's plenty of those available. I can always buy you media impressions. What I talk a lot about to clients is the population is finite, and your customer base is finite. So getting back to this concept of, you know, billions of, you know, cookies, and there's 324 million in the population, and one of the things that I, you know, quickly learned when I was working in China is, and the challenges of programmatic when I was working on PNG is we used to be able to buy impressions on CPD, cost per day, because in China there's billions of impressions and no one's sold on a CPM basis. And you're like, well, there's no point me buying a website for an entire day because the frequency of 100 against the person is kind of a waste of time. And so the whole challenges of programmatic, like the reason we have fraud, these challenges with viewability, the challenges with cross-device, is if you, if you pull it all back to an identity basis and go, look, at the end of the day, I need to reach, I know how many people are in the market for my product. So if, you, like if I'm trying to reach people that need to buy cat food, categorically, anyone who doesn't own a cat isn't in my market. So I don't need to buy 324 million impressions. I, need, I don't need to buy 324 million people. I need to buy people who own cats. So that's when identity becomes important. And then everything fraudulent starts to come into play because then you go, are you really someone who sits in this audience identity basis of owning cats or am I just doing a lookalike on you? And that's why fraud exists because people aren't verifying identity. The viewability thing I think is a bigger challenge because that becomes one of the things I think as an industry we haven't properly solved for is we should all – the, the notion that non-viewable impressions have value is, to me, nonsensical. Everything should be 100% viewable. The metric we should be measuring is what's the value of a view and what's the value of time of a view. And that's where identity then becomes important because you should be, I should be 100% viewable against the audience that matters to me. And then what I should be measuring is the viewed rate of that audience and is, and I'll use that cat owner example, is someone who views my ad, whether it's display or video, for 5, 10, 15, or 30 seconds, more valuable. The more they view it or the less they view it. And then the cross-device thing is the other value of like solving for identity and programmatic. Because again, I'm not buying impressions, I'm in buying audience. And then what becomes also interesting is I can start solving for the household basis as well because I can link identity back to household and start getting the value of a brand or a message out across the household. 
So, so this is a, a nice lead into, you know, kind of the next, you know, kind of challenge that a lot of brands are, are facing is just this whole notion of walled gardens. And I think there's a lot of debate about it. Um, how do you think about it? Because it's not just kind of the platform players. I mean, a walled garden could be certainly a retailer or could even be other types of data companies where you actually don't know what the ingredients are. What's, what's your point of view on that? Uh, <clears throat> look, and part of me thinks we as an industry have made a rod for our own back because we haven't focused on – everyone's run around and built a DMP strategy without an identity strategy at the head end. Uh, I'm torn between you – know, I share the industry frustration that you know, Google and Facebook get an inordinate share of the money, but they – back to the article I wrote, they get an inordinate share of the money because – Identity is built into their core platform, and it's easy to verify return on ad spend against real people. Uh, the trouble for brands is they're a, bit, they're a little bit opaque, and you're losing value of capturing who those customers are and being able to measure them in alternative channel, channels. Uh, do the platforms and the retailers deliver value? Uh, absolutely. Are we giving them too much value and giving them too much control over identity? Absolutely as well. And I would like what brands need to do is they need to step up and start owning not a DMP but identity so that they know their customers better so that because, I mean, Google and Facebook have sort of woken up to the trend and now allow you to onboard your own data into their platform so that you're targeting your own customers. And so what I would argue is if you're not actually building out your own customer set and using that to inform how you take advantage of Facebook and Google, you're selling yourself short and that's the way the market's going to move. So don't see control of your data strategy to the platform, platforms and retailers. Take control of it yourself. And last of all, if I put the data companies in the, the last bucket, and I know sort of Newstar loosely might sit in there is make sure you know what ingredients are going in or partner with those data companies so that you're using their technology to verify your identity and don't just keep augmenting what's in your data set without knowing the ingredients. So don't just sign on the dotted line going, oh, wow, I get 30 other data sets added in and now I'll know a whole lot more. Stop and ask the question, what exactly are you giving me where are you sourcing it from? How do you know you can trust it? And more importantly, why should I trust what you're giving me instead of going out to one of my preferred second party data sources or partners? I, I think that's a really important point because what you're ultimately talking about is there is so much data now and when you start moving from just a world where data is not connected but once it starts to become connected, I think this is where you start to see a lot more complexity, right? More connections, more data, more complexity. And this is really where it starts to become, I think, one of the key issues for a marketer is you have a, this sea of billions of data elements, but at the end of the day, identity will always be singular. Yeah, it gets back to, like, there's a finite number of people. There's a finite number of identity. And any time you look beyond that, you're, you're taking too much risk. Yeah, that, that's fine. And I think your point about, you know, we, we might uh, be uh, categorizing or describing things um, incorrectly. It's not necessarily that we have a fraud. We have Correct. Yeah. Like, the industry gets so torn up in fraud. You need to focus, like, fraud exists because we don't verify identity. So you need to then, you know, focus on identity and then it becomes about making connection, like, sort of, the really big important thing, and this, you know, slide sets up well, is once you've got identity, then you can focus on what brands should be focused on, which is connections, making connections, and focusing on who people are connected to. Well, that's one of the things that, you know, you, you, you talk a lot about, which is you are what you are connected to. And I think this is, you know, one of the exciting things that we're starting to realize that 
in a connected world, it really is the biggest trend over the next decade. Everything will be connected, products and services, online and offline. So data is just table stakes. If you don't understand connection, that's where you get the context. And if you think about it, this is the emergence of this new interdisciplinary field, which data science is still important, but you need to bring in two other areas. One is understanding communications networking, which is understanding how to connect to something. That really is all about addressability, and we've seen some of it, um, certainly when you think about addressable TV or addressable advertising, but the addressing, how something is connected is really critical to understand. And as you move into the world of IoT, a lot more is going to be connected. So understanding all those addresses is critical. But then you also need to understand what you brought up, which is, I think, part and parcel with the fraud issue, is you need to understand how to authenticate something. You need to validate both sides of the connection. And that really is this discipline in network security and cryptography. And I think this So, like, I'm just going to jump in there. I think the bit that's interesting for me, and you sort of touched on it briefly, was that IoT aspect, which is if you look at the way the market's evolving an emergency, identifying people is really, really important, and I cannot, can't underscore that enough. But IoT starts unlocking this new world because we are, like, we talk a lot about non-human traffic and fraud being an issue, but it at some point, Alexa and Google Home, they're going to be, you know, they're non-human traffic that matters, and you need to be able to link that back to an identity layer. Otherwise, people will start discounting the purchase made by an Alexa and go, well, I don't know who that was, or sort of this, you know, I've got machine-based learning, and so things will be going on in my home, like Alexa will automatically order things for me while I'm out because they'll know that I'm running out. And so linking that back to an identity layer and knowing which customer is associated with that and why that customer is important so then you don't market to them because you know they've bought the product will become really, really important. So it's this trusted identity piece at the core, but getting this data science piece right and the communication networking and validating every side of the transaction. It's just it's a new discipline which the industry is not really geared up for yet, but something we're going to have to address, make sure we take care of, and don't repeat the mistakes of the past, which was not validating identity at the start. I mean, when I was working for news in paid content, the whole problem that newspapers had is they were giving content away for free, and it's not so much that giving content away for free is the problem, it's giving content away with no value exchange of identity meant they weren't able to properly monetize or use the, their audience in meaningful ways. You know, it's, it's, it's such a great segue because now you start talking about what is really the priority of the marketer and how do they think about this in context. And I think, you know, uh, so many in the sell side of the business, whether they're a vendor, you know, selling technology, ad tech, martech, I think we all get caught up in a lot of this jargon, and at the end of the day, what is really the focus of a CMO or for a marketer? You know, they're focused on truly understanding their brand purpose, or they're really trying to understand how to integrate everything, or really coming up with the playbook for the 21st century. And, you know, you work with brands, and I, I don't think they're going to go into their exec meetings to talk to their CEO and talk about cookies, right, or talk about, you know, no. ability. They're, they're talking about business objectives. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, you know, I always say, like, media agencies today are less about, at least on the digital side, less about buying media and working as consultants to solve business problems, which typically sit in the buckets of either, you know, driving growth or building business assets or, you know, connecting to customers in sort of omni-channel experiences. And all of that, you know, links back to it's Yes, it's about selling units, but consumers can only consume a certain volume of product per day. So it's linking back to where am I, like, I, categorically, don't talk about cookies. I talk about, okay, where are your customers today? What volume do you need to drive with your existing customers? How many more customers do we need to get? And how are we going to do this in a real-time, 
you know, deterministic authoritative way that we're not just guessing and making assumptions all the time. Because, you know, every market I work with has, you know, their market mix model or they're working with a multi touch attribution partner. And I mean we've got you've got that excellent slide coming up and I don't know if we want to jump to it now, Stephen, which is Sure, sure. You know it's the one where moving beyond media, moving beyond online, offline, and you get to like how do you actually measure the results that you're getting? So if you want to drive growth and you're trying to invest your money and I might be the digital person, but you've got to invest your money in the right channel that makes sense. And if you're measuring identity, not only on digital, but on each of those individual channels, it gets better, it gets easier and better to solve uh, customer loyalty, attribution, and which media touch points are driving ROI, or which combination of media touch points are driving ROI. So, so really trying to solve this and, and bring back this idea of an identity strategy, that is a great segue into this imperative of the customer graph. And I think a lot of folks may ask, well, what do you mean by the customer graph? You know, I just want to clarify, this is a concept where you actually understand every touch point, online or offline, about your customer. So if this is, you know, take it, uh, J and J, one of you know Universal McCann's clients. You know this would actually be understanding at the J and J level every single customer interaction across the portfolio of brands. You could certainly apply it to a specific brand, but the idea is you want to elevate this to the business level. This is really about creating a critical business asset because you're spending all this money on tech, on data. You should be creating an asset that will have value on the balance sheet. And this is the opportunity to start shifting marketing from being a cost center to truly having it be a profit center where you actually are building real assets for the business. Do you want to share a little bit about your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, to me, like, the importance of building this customer graph is it's getting beyond the silos of brand and building what I would call institutional enterprise knowledge of your customers so that organizationally you benefit and so every brand benefits from every activity that you undertake and I get back to sort of one of my sort of frustration points in the industry which is it's not this DMP strategy of all these other things that you're layering on it's like here is my customer this is you know and people get all sort of funny about PII data but this is my customer this is the the data that I actually know about them like meaningful PII data. It's not it's, You're not using the PII data out in the open web or passing it on to anyone else, but it's categorically knowing who people are, how they're consuming, interacting with your brands, consuming your brands on every channel that occurs, and then being able to play, play a strategic game about how you get the most value out of that customer, and that means how do you work them across the portfolio? How do you ensure you're connecting with them in meaningful ways where the customer wants to be? And it moves us all away from and it takes you sort of into the Hulu, Netflix, Amazon size of the world, which is you're not out there to push things out to customers anymore. It's about having that customer insight, that customer graph, which makes you allow, enables you to make deterministic understanding of what does that customer want to do next? How can I get, be there to fulfill that need instead of being a marketer as a push message? Marketing then becomes a servant of the customer. And by being a servant of the customer, you're driving better business value. So you're hitting on a really important point, which is this is way beyond media. And when you actually have identity at the heart of your customer graph, I think a lot of people confuse, you know, a cookie does not equal identity. Just because you have an email address or a social login or even a purchase transaction, none of those things equal identity. And so when you think of really trying to understand how to build this customer graph, having identity at the core is going to 
add value to the business, just like you said, you know, enterprise value, you could apply this to customer loyalty. You could apply this to customer service, to a call center, understanding customer lifetime value if you're working with the CFO. The, the use cases are, are so many when you think about really understanding a customer graph anchored in identity. Um, you talk a lot about, you know, this notion of you, you – need to have identity in real time and how identity is not static. Can you share a little, a little bit what you mean by that? All right. The, my, one of the things that's sort of consistent is everything changes, uh, which is sort of ironic. And one of the things that's really easy to do is you build, you know, your identity base and you go, okay, we're going to refresh the data every 30 days. Or we'll, and you go, like, Behavior changes, frequency of consumption changes, frequency of visits change, and actually sort of going in and refreshing that data, but also applying some analysis to that data is very important. One of the things I talk a lot about to our, my clients is this notion of customers and frequency of transaction or consumption or incidents, and you go, What's your look back period and how do things change if you look back? Is a customer new to your store if you look back seven days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days and playing with those sorts of attributes and identifying what other things are changing in their life? Because, I mean, the, the category I sort of go to a lot is automotive category, which is I always say that there's sort of two concepts in auto, which is people are in market, which means you know their existing lease has expired and they're actively looking for the car. And then the flip side is people are always in market because there's brands that will go in and out of your consideration set and having things going, like understanding that customer and other things that are interesting in their lives becomes useful for you when you have customers that go into market. So if I go, hey, and I don't ski, but if you pretend to go, Joshua just took a ski trip, that's interesting. And he drove to his ski trip. That's a useful identity layer to attach to the record of Joshua because when he eventually goes in the market for the car, that might be something that will inform my creative further down the line. So you have to look beyond the immediate need of what you think is important for now when someone's in market and what's valuable identity attributes to apply to the customer in the future, but also continuously refresh that because I might have gone for a ski trip last week, but if I did a road trip to the Grand Canyon this weekend, you go, okay, ski trips aren't important because he's actually just into travel with the family in the car. These are things I need to pick up and apply to my identity stream moving forward. And I think one of the most important things that you just touched upon is that this is about a snapshot in time. I think people don't realize that identity really is not static. And as you go through a time dimension, where you are either in the calendar year, your mindset in February around Valentine's Day will be different from holiday time in December, but all those other things in terms of life events, I think that really is understanding all the different dimensions to you know your customer graph. And when you think about it, this is really where I think brands need to fall back in love with first-party data, truly anchoring it with CRM. And CRM yeah. has – really been so static and, and stale. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, I always, you know, I laugh because CRM sort of became the dirty three-letter three acronym for the industry and everyone got obsessed with DMPs. And I think it's in part because CRM failed to deliver on the promise of one-to-one -one marketing, whereas what was really lost is, and it, you know, it shouldn't be customer, you know, relationship management. It should be customer identity management. And if you focus in on the customer and the relationship is not this communication path, but managing the relation, like understanding the relationships that they have and the connections they have, that would be the valuable thing. So if you look at if you look at slide 30 and this collect, corroborate, correlate, and connect, 
that becomes the value of the customer graph and your CRM strategy. It's not so much about using it for sending out direct mail or sending out an EDM or texting someone with an offer. It's about using that to inform your understanding of the customer, then using that to inform your business strategy, and then inform, using that to inform your communication strategy. That's where the value, the value from CRM comes from. Yeah, and, and then, you know, you, you, you talk a lot about how so much of this is also just stale, like the, the whole idea of doing this in a batch basis where you might get it, you know, kind of once a month or once a year. Um, you, you know, the whole idea of being able to corroborate something in real time, correlate it. This, this goes back to your authentication piece, right? Um, you, you know, doing it in real time matters. Doing it in real time matters, and... The great thing about working with your first party data is consumers, customers interact with brands. Like they engage with your products, they engage with you on social media, they engage with you on your website. We're in a world where people want to have a conversation with your brand. So if you're not leveraging those conversations to understand the identity of the customers to make your institutional enterprise value of your organization more valuable in the way you engage with customers, you're missing, you know, you're missing the boat. Right. And, and so that kind of brings up this really interesting idea of how should you think about waiting? You know, you, everyone talks about a media mix all the time. I don't think people really think about a data mix. And so when you're building your customer graph, you really need to have that solid foundation of your identity strategy, you know, providing that framework to build your customer graph on top of, but you really want to put that weight on first party data um, and second party data for those that you know may not uh, understand uh, or know what what second party data is it really just means going direct you know if you are a brand why wouldn't you go direct cut out the middleman find a way and you know this is something that given the security side of the newstar business we help a lot of brands have a secure data locker in the cloud but find a way to kind of you know have your data that you'll put in the middle and then you'll bring a partner. It could be a publisher. It could be a retailer. It could be a non-competitive brand. But the whole idea is how can you get more signals, more inputs to really build out your customer graph and second-party data partnerships that are direct and private and secure, I think that is a, is a, is a wealth of you know, insight where you could actually have brands building out their customer graph. Yeah, I mean, on, you know, slide 31, you know, what's your data mix and what would I advocate? It almost gets to your classic 70-20-10, which is 70% of your focus should be on getting your first party data right, and you only add in, you know, third party data as the 10%, if, like, if and when as you need it. You should be able to get enough scale. There should be 90% of your scale between first party and second party data sources. And, you know, what are some tips that, you know, you would give to folks listening to the webinar? Um, you, you said that you had some easy ways to start thinking about first-party data because I think a lot of things, a lot of the statements that brands say is, oh, well, I don't have first-party data. You know, I might not be like brand XYZ where they actually have content or they have, you know, some way to capture that first-party data. But you actually have lots of other ways to think about first-party data than you may realize. Yeah, so there's a couple of, like, I'll start by saying they're not ideal, but in terms of building blocks and getting your organization thinking about it, uh, the first point of entry for me is always looking at your web analytics or your site analytics offerings. And if you're using, like, the Google 360 suite or Adobe or something like that, uh, and Google's interesting because it's got identity built into their analytics account because people log in to Gmail and YouTube. So first port of call is looking some of the audience on identity data that you're getting there. The second one that's interesting to play with, and I encourage you know brands starting out to experiment with the uh, audience manager within Facebook. And it'll sound a little bit nefarious, but what's interesting to do is if you start going into that because you know Facebook's deterministic identity because everyone goes in there and reveals everything about themselves categorically. As you go in there and start building audience segments as if you were going to buy an ad, but you don't buy an ad, to start 
understanding your customers better. So you go, hey, if I add in this market and location, how many people can I reach? And that at least allows you to start sizing the potential scope of your identity audience and what you start needing and then what you need to build out because you can measure that against because you will have most businesses have some sort of legacy CRM system or an e-commerce transaction that's occurred on their site where they haven't captured all the information that they need but playing with web analytics and face like web analytics and Facebook at least lets you start testing going okay how much do I know how much do I not know and what should I start asking for what am I seeing in this analytics and Facebook data which would actually make a difference for my brand if I knew categorically those things to be true about a customer how would that then start changing the way we approached our business or how it would have changed the way we communicated with those customers so that's where I would start and then the, the next bit is you start have to organically building your customer identity graph and that means not intrusive demands for registration or 400, you know, question surveys when product asking them, you know, what their favourite colour and what their nickname in high school was, but having a progressive strategy for them building up that identity over time based on an understanding of what's valuable, and that's like a perfect setup to 32, which is how to approach your identity strategy and things to consider when you're building a customer graph is identifying what your purpose is and so too many people rush out and they build a DMP because DMPs are cool and everyone apparently should have one is and that's why I encourage people to play with the free tools first is what's the purpose what's the business outcome you're trying to solve for what are the data what's the bits of data that you need so aside from knowing who the customer is like first name last name how to connect with them and where to find them it's what else do I need to know to actually achieve my business outcome because if I need to drive sales growth or if I need to drive incidental consumption or if I need to identify them across multiple touch points that will start identifying okay then my identity strategy is about building out and augmenting these things and then you can do a data audit and building out your data criteria about what do I have now and where am I going to start sourcing these things and to get back to something we spoke about earlier where is my source of trust? What am I going to trust to build these things out and then I can map them, authenticate and then manage it going forward with this constant refresh quality thing because this is not a, a project that you go, okay, we've built our customer graph now onto the next new and shiny thing. It's like how are we constantly going to keep refreshing this? Hey, Joshua, when, when you think about uh, kind of negotiations that you have with partners, with vendors, do you include data as part of those negotiations? Like what are some tips that you would actually give to the, the brands, um, you know, the, the marketers that are on the phone? So, so the answer to that is yes. Are people reluctant to share data? Yes. Uh, and what I, like the encouragement I give everyone is you need to look for the shared win and explain the exchange of value which is you know what it's easy to sort of say I want data without explaining why and this gets back to this purpose and strategy piece which is you don't want all the data you need to explain which bits you want and why and normally you can get it but I'm also mindful that I'd love to answer some questions for people on the call of course, and uh, you know, I think this sets up nicely to you know, kind of the last slide, which uh, it sounds like the key takeaways you have are have an identity strategy, and when you think about all of these data elements that you are bringing into your customer graph, really understand that you need to design audiences with measurement in mind, and ultimately that this customer graph is a strategic business asset. It really can become a competitive advantage to fuel your whole enterprise. Um, so with that, why don't we, uh, Stuart, take the first question? 
Great. Well, well, thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Joshua. A lot of great information. I'm sure people have been listening quite intently. Uh, I just want to remind our audience of a couple quick things. First off, if you've got a question for our speakers, uh, just use the Q&A widget on 24. We're going to get to a few of them uh, in, the, uh, in the next moments that we have here. Uh, and if we don't get to your question, uh, submit it anyway, by the way. Uh, if we don't get to it, I'll make sure that it gets forwarded over to the speakers today. I uh, also want to remind everyone uh, the slide deck is available in the resource list folder, so you can download a PDF of the slides there to uh, share with some of your colleagues. Um, so go ahead and head on over there. Uh, lastly, webinar has been recorded, so if you want to get back uh, and listen to this a second time or have your colleagues listen to it, uh, you'll be getting an email in about two hours with a link over to the on-demand version. Uh, let, let me jump right in here. Um, and, and Joshua, I'm going to send this your way. Stephen, feel free certainly to uh, uh, chirp in on this one. But you know, you had a lot covering uh, first-party data, and you were talking a lot about CRM. And I think uh, a lot of people know about uh, third-party data. But there's a lot of questions about second-party data. And uh, you know, someone even asked, what, what's the best way to get second-party data? Uh, you know, when especially when neither party sort of has the infrastructure or experience to sort of form these relationships. Uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit of maybe first defining second-party, uh, and also you know how you go about actually getting it and, and incorporating that into your into your customer graph. Yeah, uh, so second party data, the easiest way to, to find out is it's someone else's first party data. Uh, and sort of the easy, there's, and I, I'm not going to give anyone a free plug right now, there's a, a couple of aggregators that actually work with retailer data to get that available in a non anonymized, meaningful way. Uh, so I mean, I have a lot of CPG clients, so my initial focus would be look at your retail distribution partners or who you're retailing or who your channel partners are and look at that as party data. So in, I would call those your customers, so not consumers, but customers of your products who then on sell onto consumers. And if you deal direct the consumer, then what I'd be looking for is uh, Analogous industries or complementary product or categories where you know people shop across your industry set. And so I'll use automotive as an example. You know, if you're a tire manufacturer, you know, automotive manufacturer is a nice complementary partner in a non competitive way. So they're people you should be looking at as a partner in your second party data cloud. And Newstar also has a second party private data locker as well. Stephen, any uh, any comments there? I know you've got again. You just got a little bit of the plug, but uh, want, want to give a, a, no. a ten second plug here? Yeah, no, I think it's a uh, you know let's more application, right? um, which is really think very robustly about all the different in kind of your ecosystem. So I'll use an example. Um, you know, not that uh, we're working with them on this uh, particular uh, example, but think about uh, the Super Bowl that just happened and the Mr. Clean ad that Procter & Gamble ran. If you think about it, that was really interesting for Mr. Clean being a Super Bowl. But when you think about it, why couldn't Proctor then think about, hey, what are all the second-party partners that we could actually work with? Maybe they could have done it joint. And you actually, in a, in a, in a second-party private data locker, bring you know the Mr. Clean, you know, or, or the Procter and Gamble customer graph, you know, bring in some of their data they could share, and then bring in Fox that actually ran the Super Bowl, and so that could be a joint. So that's a media publisher and a CPG come together. Maybe there is a retailer that comes in. So maybe Procter wants to do something with Target, and again, they each don't want to give away all of their data, but they could figure out what to share, and then you could just go down the line. Maybe there's a quick service restaurant. Would Procter and McDonald's be interesting? Would Procter and Ford be interesting? I think there's lots of different ways to dimensionalize second party, and I think it's one of the most exciting areas for brands to really think about how can we go to direct and start to bring in ways to build our customer graph. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the clock. It looks like we're, we're getting towards the top of the hour, but we've got time for, for a quick question here. Uh, and this is someone sort of asking a little bit of, you know, future oriented. Uh, and, you know, they're talking about really sort of, that we, you know, 
Today, we really don't have a lot of the technology for measuring, you know, sort of the offline behavior. What, how are people behaving when they're when they're not connected? And he's sort of asking, you know, how do you envision sort of, you know, consolidating this? So, you know, are you sort of creating proxies? Uh, and you know, where is all of this going? Where's all Joshua, of this? I mean, I would challenge. Yeah, I would challenge back and say some of like offline people tend to pay with. Uh, cards, whether they be credit or debit cards. So I'd say that the offline data is available. It's just that people aren't using it because they're not able, like today, they're not linking it back to customers that are their own. So I'd say it's available today. It's less of a future. There might be a future challenge because people aren't taking advantage of it, but the data exists and is available. And in the offline world, you know, that will start informing the way you merchandise as well because You'll be basing it on real people. You'll be knowing who comes into your store. You'll start changing the way you merchandise from that. You look at what Amazon's doing with their fresh concept stores. It's based on this concept of known identity from their app. Like the market's moving there. I think it's just been slower to take advantage of it than it should have been. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's another great example, Joshua, of where IoT comes into play. I don't think people realize that IoT is here. Um, you know, there's going to be incredible opportunities but incredible challenges. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that in October, we actually saw the first weaponized DDoS attack from IoT devices, you know, where your DVR was working for the enemy, and it actually took down sites like PayPal and Twitter for a period of time. But on the flip side, on the, op on the opportunities, when more and more things have sensors, have beacons, you could actually really start bringing in all of those inputs into your customer graph. And that's where you need to think about this beyond media. You know, what do you do when you can't show an impression? How do you actually think about the experience in retail, in a bank branch, in a dealership? There's so many different ways. And then when you think about things like connected car, these are you know, not things that are far from the future. They are all things that are being developed right now. And so as you see this idea of the connected world really come to life over the next couple of years, I think that's where an opportunity is going to be really to apply your customer graph to all those touch points online and offline. Great. Well, Stephen and Joshua, I want to thank you both uh, for a lot of great information, uh, a lot for people to digest here. I uh, just want to remind our audience the slides are in the resource list folder, so go ahead over there and download the PDF. Uh, On-demand version recording uh, will be live in about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, just check back uh, here and you'll, you'll find it or check your email. We're going to be sending out a notice uh, with uh, a link over to the on-demand version. Uh, also, uh, lastly, if you enjoyed today's webinar, check out what, we, uh, what we've got coming up at Adweek. Uh, so it's adweek.com slash webinars. You'll see our webinar calendar. Sign up for some things we've got coming up in the future. Check out what we've got available on demand. Again, uh, thanks to our speakers, uh, thanks to our audience, and we look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming Ad Week webinar.